Listen to me. Some of you are drunk on your own self-righteousness. And you don't realize it because you're intoxicated with yourself. And you run around saying, oh, the world would be just a better place if everybody did it the way I think it should be done. You know, just, just follow my lead. Here we go. Pivot. Hey, Sandals Church. Man, so thankful for everybody here today. Glad you're here. Glad you guys are joining us online or at a local campus. Super excited. Hope you, are, you enjoyed our, our, our opening to last week, Pivot. How to change when you don't want to. This week we're gonna talk about how to, how to change and how to become less judgmental. And a lot of us don't think of ourselves as judgmental. We, we think of others as judgmental. And I hope this, this sermon can help you take maybe a little more honest look at yourself. And we're gonna begin today by looking at one of the most famous passages of scripture. I I can't remember the last time I preached on this. I don't know that I've ever preached on this at Sandals, but it's one of the most famous stories uh, literally in the Bible. And, And even if you're new to Christianity or you're not a Christian, you may have heard this story. And it's a story about a woman caught in her worst moment. I want you to think about your worst moment. Your worst moment where you said the worst thing, you did the worst thing, and you are caught in that moment. And this woman is caught in that moment and instantly dragged before everybody she knows, her whole community, everybody, and she's thrown at the feet of Jesus. So we're gonna take a look at John, the Gospel of John, verse, seven, uh, verse 53, and we're gonna go all the way through verse 11. But Jesus, he went to the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning, He came to the temple and all the people came to him. So Jesus, right, he's the celebrity. Everybody's listening to him. Everybody's following him. And he sat down and taught them. Now I want you to to look at this passage in your own time because what he's doing is he's symbolizing the coming Messiah in the book of Daniel. In the book of Daniel, we see God sitting, teaching the people. It's what Jesus is doing. And then here comes the evil people, right? The scribes and the Pharisees. Usually the Pharisees are the bad guys, But in this story, the professors show up too, right? Your your collegiate professionals, they show up. They're the scholars. They're the lawyers. They're the attorneys. They're the teachers. They're the highest of the high. And they all show up to get them. And they show up, and they brought somebody with them, a woman who had been caught in adultery, in the act of adultery. And they placed, placed her in the midst. And they said to him, teacher, this woman, this woman right here has been caught in the act of adultery. Now, in the law of Moses, he commanded us to stone such a woman. What do you say? What do you say? And they said this to test him, that they might have some charge to bring against him. And then he bent down, and he begins to write in the ground. Everybody says, what did he write? We don't know. We don't know. But he's just writing in the ground. And as they continued to pester him, to come after him, finally he stood up and he said to them, Let him who is without sin among you be the first, the first to throw the stone. And once more, he bends down and he writes on the ground. And when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones, and Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. It says, then Jesus stood up and said to her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? And for the first time in the story, the woman speaks and she says, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Now go and sin no more. One of the greatest stories ever told, one of the greatest moments in the history of the world. And it's one of those moments that just lets you know Jesus is is so much different than any religious teacher, so much different than any person that you've ever met. And it's because there's no one that's ever been like him. He's not just a man, but he's God's one and only son. He's the God man. And he wants to teach you how to become less judgmental. And here's the problem. Most of us don't think we have a problem, right? Well, I'm not a judgmental person. Number one, write this down. Here's how you become less judgmental. Just admit, just admit, we're all judgmental. 
We all are. You know the first thing I do whenever I go into somebody's home to use the bathroom? The first thing I do is I look at the fan. I look at the fan because the fan tells me whether or not you're really clean. I do. I do, and now every single person that has me over their house are gonna be on ladders cleaning the fan because if I look up and I see fuzz in your fan, I judge you. I judge you. I think it's disgusting. I look up and I don't know what's dropping down. I don't know what things are trapped in that, that foam of just, just amoebas and bacteria and COVID. I don't know what's up there. You brought me to your house to kill me. That's what you did. I think it's disgusting. And we all have those things that we look at. We look at, is the house clean? We look at this, we look at that. And that's what we do every time we see somebody. Every time we see somebody, we judge them. We judge them all the time. The question is never, do you judge others? The question is always, by what standard do you judge others? That's the question. We're all judgmental, right? We all are. When we watch a game, guys, we know better than the ref that who gets paid, like you pay to watch, they get paid to ref, you think you're better? You think you're better than the players. Oh, come on, you bum. The only bums are the ones sitting watching. That's us. The question is not, do we judge? The question is, and listen to me, this is important for our country, for our world, for your family, for you personally. The question is, what standard do you use to judge others? Now, I'm gonna talk about three standards that I think that we, we all use, okay? Number one, I think some of us use a religious standard. So when I was a kid, I would hear adults say this. Growing up in a religious home, I would hear adults say, God said it, that settles it. Here's the problem. Sometimes God didn't say it. They confronted Jesus, and then he said, we found this woman caught in the act of adultery, and the law of Moses says we must stone her. That's not actually what the law says. That's not what the law says. The law does not speculate how to kill. It does speculate who to kill, and we have someone missing. You cannot tango by yourself. It takes two to tango, amen? Okay, I know all my single people are like, I don't know, I don't know, I'm, I'm trusting Jesus, pastor. Well, the married folk knows it takes two to tango. We have, we have somebody that's missing, right? You don't have murder until you have a body and you don't have adultery until we have a party. You gotta have two people. Well, God said it, that settles it. And we say these ridiculously stupid things that we think are true, but oftentimes it's just the way that you were religiously raised and it has nothing to do with Jesus. And so you just make it up. You make it up. You know the verse. No, no, tell me. Tell me. Well, you know, you know the, 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 you know, you know the thing. No, I don't. What's the verse? What's the verse? Next, some of us, well, I'm not, I'm not a religious person. And so we use cultural standards. We let the world in which we live decide for us what's right and wrong. And we say things like this. Well, that's not how I was raised. And here's the thing that you're gonna discover in America as we head towards a, as we head towards a, a political cycle People are raised differently in different parts of our country. People in the Northwest think differently than people in the Southwest, who think differently than people in the South, who think differently people in, in, in you know, the North Central part of America or the Northeastern part. Like, people think differently. Sometimes you think differently just based upon the side of the bridge that you live on or, or the side of the freeway that you live on, right? We think differently, and so what we think is the norm, we find out is just the people around me. And so oftentimes, our cultural standard is what we were taught in school. Maybe it's what we weren't taught at home. Maybe it's what we've loosely picked up by our friends. Maybe it's what we've seen on social media. But we're all using a standard to judge. And then some of us, this is my favorite one, we use a personal standard. We just make it up as we go along. Who am I to judge? Well, that's actually a, a statement of judgment. That's what you're doing when you say, who am I to judge? You've just made a judgment. And what you really mean is, I don't want to offend anybody or hurt anybody or, or I don't want to pick a side or take a side. You know, I'm going to be Switzerland everywhere I go. And then we got the religious people and the cultural people fighting it out and you're just on the sidelines. Well, I don't know. 
Hopefully there'll be a country left or a church left when you guys are done. But here's the thing, God doesn't want you to use a religious standard. God doesn't want you to use a cultural standard. God doesn't want you to use a personal standard. I love that, people all the time, well, well me and God are good. Well, how do you know? Well, I decided. Well, what does God have to say about it? God wants me to use a biblical standard for judgment. And here's the problem, man, I learned this over and over again. Just when I think I've understood the biblical standard, I learned something new. Leviticus 19.15, like everybody hates the book of Leviticus, right? Leviticus has some, some beautiful, wonderful, amazing teaching that is more relevant today than it's ever been. And many of you have discarded the book, right? It sounds like a, an infection. I got Leviticus. No, it is, it is a law written to people who were supposed to help lead the people of God. Their job was to lead the people of God. And Leviticus 19.15 says this, do not twist justice, Amen. Do not twist justice in legal matters, right? Now wait for it, because God's gonna get you. Do not twist justice in legal matters by favoring the poor. What? Who oh, no, who oh, no, what? The poor aren't always right, did you know that? They're not always right. God's not always on the side of the poor, he's on the side of what's right. Don't twist justice in legal matters by favoring the poor or by being partial to the rich and powerful. Always judge people, rich, poor, black, white, Republican, or Democrat, fairly. That's the biblical standard. Here's the problem. Sometimes the people who agree with me are wrong. Sometimes the people who agree with me politically, sometimes the people who are like me ethnically need to go to jail because they're wrong. We gotta be very, very careful that we don't run to our group, that we don't run to our party, that we run to God's word. And people on the right and people on the left and people in the middle, they all get it wrong. That's why we have God's word because if we could figure it out on our own, he wouldn't have had to write it out and call it the law. So how to be less judgmental? Just admit just admit you judge people. And you're like, well, I don't throw rocks at people. I don't throw rocks. Anybody ever thrown a rock at somebody in anger? Okay, probably just the guys. <laughs> right, all the men, yeah, once, why? <laughs> I threw a rock once that I remember, and I threw it in anger. I mean, I threw it hard. It probably wasn't this big, because this, this might kill you. But, but I tell you why, I don't know how big the rock was, because it was at night. You see, I was in the army, and we were on what's called the bivouac where we go out, and I think it means tent camping. The army has all these sayings that I don't know exactly what they mean, and we were doing it. And we were engaged in war games for three nights. Three nights we were battling other Americans so we could keep all Americans safe. And my unit got killed the first night in five minutes, right? My unit got gassed the second night, and my unit was captured the third night, and I'd had enough, because I'm a three on the Enneagram, and I wanna win. I wanna win, I don't care about protecting you, I just wanna win. And I was frustrated because in my unit, I had Gomer Pyle and Doofus McGee on my team. And I'd had it. And so we're trying to carry out the orders that we're given and we're supposed to maintain silence. And so we communicate to each other with hand signs. But I can only communicate to you with hand signs if you're looking at me. I didn't want to get tear gassed, I didn't want to get captured, and I didn't want my little alarm to go, you're dead, you're dead, you're dead. And so Doofus McGee is not listening to what I'm saying because I'm in command, and he won't look at me, and in anger, I grab a rock, and I throw it, and I missed. But I didn't miss everyone. I just missed the someone I was throwing at, and I hear a thud, and then I hear my commanding officer say, who threw the D-A-M rock? I didn't mean to hit him, but I did. Isn't that amazing? That's why God doesn't want you throwing rocks because a lot of times we hit the wrong person. Hit the wrong person. Oh my gosh. In anger, in a moment of rage, in a moment of stupidity, I picked up a rock, I chucked it, and now I'm like gonna go to military jail. I'm a fragile human being. <laughs> right? Number two, write this down. You wanna become less judgmental? 
Try to understand why. Why, why do you judge others? You're like, because people are stupid. Okay, well, why else? Why else? We judge people, here's the reality, who have sinned. The next time you're angry at people, just understand they're sinners. When you're, you're just screaming at your two-year-old, what's your problem? They're a sinner. They got it from you. You're raising them as a sinner. Right? We judge people who sin. Kate, did this woman sin in the story? Absolutely. If you didn't know, adultery is not a good thing. Adultery is a sin against your own soul. It affects your family. It, it affects your marriage. It affects everything around you. It is disastrous in terms of a life decision. It wrecks people. It destroys people. We judge people who sin. And there's some of you, you know, you're like, well, I had this rock, I didn't know what to do with it, and she did it. She was caught, whack, and we just throw it. But the problem is, we're sinners too. Which is why Jesus says, let he who is without sin throw the first stone. He doesn't get into a political argument about who's right and who's wrong. He does the exact opposite of what you do. We judge people who've sinned. And let me just say this, there is a right and there is a wrong. There are things that are clearly right and there are things that are clearly wrong. And some people will hurt you and will sin against you. Then there's those, next point, who've hurt us, right? Maybe it's your mom, maybe it's your dad, maybe it's your kids. Somebody that was supposed to protect you, they hurt you. And you just carry that rock around your whole life. Right? You just have it with you. Somebody who lied to you. Somebody who betrayed you. People who've hurt us. You say, well, I'm not a person who likes to hurt people, but they did it first. And then I think more and more in our culture, it's people who oppose us. People who think differently. People who believe differently. Right? You know, you would never kill anybody unless they're a Democrat. Or unless they're Republican. Unless they're for Trump or against Trump, right? And instantly as Christians, the most important thing to us is no longer Jesus. It's either what's gonna keep America great or what's gonna unite America. And the problem is neither Trump nor Biden is the answer. But this is the problem. And we all throw it, we all do. We judge people because they're against us. And lastly, I think we judge without all the facts, don't we? You know what happens? We become the judge, the jury, and the, ex and the executioner. We do. You see, not only do I judge what you did, but oh, I figure out the mo motive and I prove it in my mind. And we think we know why people do things. Can I just be honest with you? I don't know why I do things. You ever do something and you're like, why did I do that? But you think, you, you don't know why you do what you do, but you know whatever, you, I know why you did that. Right? You said that because you're a racist, sexist. You said that because you hate gay people, you hate Christians, right? You, that, I know why you said that. Things come out of my mouth and I am like, what? What is going on? I need to have a meeting. My, my mouth and my brain need to have a meeting and we need to get on the same page. You ever said something and you're just like, what? Like you can't, you can't yell at yourself. You're like, what, what, what were we thinking? And then my wife will say, well, you wouldn't have said it if. And I'm like, ah, I don't know why that came out. But we rush to judgment. We see a video, we see a statement, we see a tweet. And we rush to judgment and we make an instantaneous judgment because we think we've got all the facts. We gotta be so careful. We gotta be so careful. 
Like, if I have to judge you, do you want me to get the facts or you just want me to go with what I think? We're all that juror that looks at the person of suspicion and says, yeah, they look guilty. Right? We do. We do that. We judge. Without all the facts. I don't know you. I don't know what happened. I wasn't there. But we go with our eyes, and our eyes are not always accurate. we got to be so careful. Jesus, should we kill her? The law of Moses says we need to kill her. What do you say, Jesus? Where's the man? Where's the man? You know what the law says? The law says both must be put to death. We've only solved 50%, not of the solution, but of the accusation. My next question is, how were they caught? What are you doing watching people? What are you, some peeping Tom? Like, if we're going to throw rocks, amen, I'm going to throw it at Tom. Come here, peep. What, were these two just in the street, couldn't control themselves? Or were they in a room and you followed them? Like, I got questions about you, buddy. What are you doing? You know what else the law says? The eyewitnesses have to throw the first rock. I see a bunch of people with a rock who actually saw this woman. And let's just be honest. You know why we judge people? We judge people because we believe we're better. We just do. We're disgusted by people who don't think like us, agree with us, drive like us. Man, it's, it's just amazing. We live in a toxic world. In one week, I got yelled at because we required masks, and I got yelled at by somebody else because we didn't require everyone to wear a mask. I got, I got, I, both sides are hitting me with rocks. Romans 12, three. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, you are not to think of himself or ladies, herself, wanna be fair, more highly than they ought to think, but to think with sober judgment. You know what happens? We get drunk on ourselves. We get drunk. And we say stupid things. We come to stupid conclusions. Listen to me. Some of you are drunk on your own self-righteousness. And you don't realize it because you're intoxicated with yourself. And you run around saying, oh, the world would be just a better place if everybody did it the way I think it should be done. Man, how to be less judgment, this is so key. Learn to have judgment like Jesus. Learn to have judgment like Jesus, right? Like if you're a Christian, like this is the goal in life. How on earth do I have judgment like Jesus? And here's the key. Jesus wasn't judgmental, but he had judgment. He had judgment. Like if you run around saying, who am I to judge? You've not listened to a thing the Bible says because the Bible actually says that one day you and I will judge angels. You better practice. You better practice. You better get ready. Because God is gonna lift you up from slavery and put you in a position of authority. And you need to be ready and you need to have judgment and you need to think and you need to be able to act. Here's what I've learned. When it's personal, you can have an opinion. Now you ask me, Pastor Matt, what do you think? What do you think about politics? I ask three questions because I don't trust you. I don't trust you. I love you, but I don't trust you. You ask me, Pastor Matt, what do you think about Trump? What do you think about Biden? What do you think about this? What do you think about that? Listen to me. I ask three questions when you ask me that. You say, it's personal. This is just between us girls. <laughs> Number one, I ask myself, is this an intimate relationship? Do I trust you? Do I know you? Is, are you somebody that I have spoken to before and we can converse and we can talk about things and, and it's a healthy environment where, where this stays between us and we can actually share thoughts and opinions. Because I don't know if you know this, I have thoughts and opinions that I don't share with you. Is this an intimate relationship where they know me and they love me and if I say something partially wrong, anybody do that? 
that they're gonna give me grace. And they're gonna say, well, I know what he said, but here's what I think he meant. Because I know him and I love him. So number one, are we intimate? Do we, do we know each other? Number two, is it relevant? Does it matter? Does it matter? Pastor Matt, what do you think about the economy in Brazil? I was there once in 1987. I don't know. I don't know. Haven't been back since. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I don't know. I, I don't know. Right? And some of us just talk about everything so that we can talk about everything and not get personal or get real ever. And so we push all of our conversations outside so we don't have to deal with what's inside. Like, so, so it, it, are, are we intimate and I can trust you and we can talk about this? Is this a safe place to talk? Is it relevant? Like, is it something that we should be talking about? Like, like I can make a difference, my opinion matters. And then here's the next thing, is it appropriate? Because I don't know about you, but my mouth likes to move. My mouth likes to talk. Here's a Bible verse that I hate. He who talks much, sins much. Pray for your pastor. Some of you didn't hear me. He who talks much, sins much. The more your mouth moves, the more you're gonna sin. And all the fives on the Enneagram are like, amen. I mean, they didn't say that, but they thought it, right? Is it, are we intimate? Is it relevant? And is it appropriate? Should we, should we be talking about this? You know, the Bible actually says there are some things you shouldn't even talk about. You shouldn't even, you shouldn't even speak of it. When Jesus spoke, listen to me, it was always God's word. When you speak, it's usually your words. And oh, oh. Man, if, if you're a wife, you have a special role. You have a special role. Like you're the Holy Spirit's assistant. You just are. Because us guys, right, we get around each other. You know what I would do, and then what I would do, and then what we would do, and we just start talking. And here's what happens when I start, when you see me like in the Wild West, and I'm talking, and we're at a table, watch my wife's hands. My wife's hands will disappear from the table, and they will, like, she has like, like super stretch arm strong hands, and they will go across, and they go on my knee, and at first it's a gentle squeeze, which means I need to make eye contact. And then afterwards, we'll get in the car and she'll say this, you need to remember you're a pastor. You need to remember that what you say has weight. Listen to me, you need to remember you call yourself a Christian and what you say has weight. And somebody needs to reach across the table and give a gentle squeeze and make eye contact. And lovingly, full of the Holy Spirit, say, shut up. <laughs> right? Whenever Jesus spoke, here's what the law of Moses says. What do you say, Jesus? Only Jesus could say, you've heard it said, but I say unto you. You and I don't get to say that. We get to say, you've heard it said, but Jesus said unto us. Right, the commandments aren't just for lost people, they're for the church. The apostle Paul has asked a question from the church in Corinth, and the question is what to do if you become a Christian and you're married to a non-Christian? And here's why it's a question, because Ezra, in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah said you should get divorced. This is one of the hardest to understand passages in the scripture. What do you say, Paul? Here's what Paul says. Now I will speak to the rest of you, though I do not have a direct command from the Lord. That's in the Bible. You know what he says, I went to God, I asked God, I haven't heard anything from God. And then he goes on to say, but what, I, what I'm going to share with you, I think is approved. And he says, I think you should remain married and stay as you are. You see, sometimes we find ourselves in these, 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 these situations where there's not a direct verse, or if there is a direct verse, we have to navigate it according to the gospel and according to Jesus and our new life in Christ. Paul's like, look guys, I'm gonna share with you my opinion. This is what I think is best. So, if it's personal, you get an opinion, right? If it's, if it's you, like you're talking, but when it's a person, you must have compassion. 
So what does that mean? What does that mean for me as a Christian? If you ask me what I think or believe about gay marriage, boom, out there, issue, out there, I give an opinion. Here's what I think. The Bible says it should be between a man and a woman. That's, that's my opinion in the culture. Now to you, I would say that's what God's word say. But if I meet a gay couple at our church, what do I say? I love you, God loves you, and he has a wonderful plan for your life. I have compassion on them. I don't want them to get divorced. I want them to get right with Jesus. This woman is caught in the act of adultery. She did it. We have eyewitnesses. She did it. She, she must die. What does Jesus do? He has compassion on her. He cares for her. He takes the attention off her. You ever wonder why, why he's doing this? I think it's because she's half naked. You think they took time to let her get dressed? It says she was caught in the what? In the act. She's probably bloody because she's been smacked around as she's been dragged. She's half naked, if not naked. She's been dragged into church, into the temple. Everybody's seen. Everybody's looking at her. Why does Jesus do this? It's to take attention off her and put it on himself. It's what he did on the cross for you. He took God's judgment. He took the gaze of God's judgment away from you and he put it on himself. And everybody quits looking at her and everybody looks at him. I love this. Then Jesus stood up and he said to her, he looks her face to face. Has no one condemned you? It's the first time she speaks. She said, no one, Lord. And then Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. He doesn't say what you did was fine. He didn't say adultery was okay. He didn't say it wasn't sin. He said, and from now on, sin no more. You see, grace is an opportunity to change. Not to run back to the vomit from which Jesus has saved us. Let me just say this. When it's personal, you get to have an opinion. Hey, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? When it's a person, you have to have compassion. When it's public, you must exercise wisdom. This isn't a private conversation with the disciples. Jesus, what do you think about adultery? This is a public spectacle where a woman has been dragged in the center of town where everyone can see. And in nowadays, they wouldn't have taken it to, to, to the temple. They would have taken it to Instagram, to Facebook Live, to Twitter. What do you say? What do you say? You gotta exercise so much judgment because so many people won't come to Sandals, not because of what we believe, but because of what you posted on Instagram. And can I just tell you this? Can I just confess to you? I have family members that I love deeply, that I care for, that I love, that I, 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 I mean, the only reason they're in my life is because we're related with blood. We don't agree philosophically. We don't agree spiritually. We don't live practically the same way at all, but I love them. And some of those individuals are leftists. Some of those individuals are a part of, of uh, or they agree with what's happening in Seattle, what's happening in Portland. They're those people that when you see on the news, you say, they should be shot, that's my family. Now I don't agree with them, but they don't know Jesus. And then I got family that are right-wing wackos. They're looking for a reason to shoot all of us. They'll start in Portland and they'll finish with you. And they know how to shoot. They kill things regularly and then eat it. You know, some of you, you, you walk by the meat aisle and, 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 and Stater Brothers, you're like, oh God, oh, oh. They ain't those people. And they're conservative. 
gun-owning, Trump-supporting, right-wing, and they don't know Jesus. You know what I want? I don't care how they vote. I care whether or not they go to hell. I care deeply, deeply for both of them. And there's some issues on the left where I'm like, okay, I get it. And there's issues on the right where I'm like, yeah, I got you, I got you. But here's the thing. You need to know this. Listen to me and never forget this. You know why the woman is not named? Because it was never about her. John 8, 6. They said this to him to test him. That they may have what? Some charge. Any charge. To bring against him. What do you say, Jesus? Silence is violence. What do you say? There's always been a cancel culture. What do you say, Jesus? You see, Jesus is in a tough spot. You know why? He's a rabbi. He's committed to the Jewish faith. And adultery is wrong. It's a terrible crime. And any of you have had that committed against you? It may not have taken your life, but it could have ripped your soul apart. You know that. But Jesus also knows that the Jews are a conquered people. They don't have the right to kill people with mob violence. Because if there's one thing that Rome did not tolerate, it was mob violence. Rome would mop you up. They'd kill you quick. They didn't really care what you worshiped, what you did, who you slept with, what you called yourself, but you caused problems, they're gonna take care of you quick. So if Jesus says the law of Moses is wrong and keeps from being slaughtered by the Roman Empire, then he's a traitor to his people and a sellout to the Romans, but if he says she should be killed, now he's violated the law, and those same people with the rocks, they're gonna turn him in to the Romans to be killed. It's a lose-lose situation, because it was never about her, was it? And every single day, you are used by the right and by the left, and you need to know, for us as Christians, it's always about Jesus. It's always about Jesus. And I'm not perfect. I make mistakes. I've said things publicly that I've had to backtrack. But here's the thing you need to know as Christians, we don't get a second chance. We don't. And you have to be so careful. Pastor Matt, this is off the record. Nothing is ever off the record. Nothing. Pastor Matt, this is personal. You gotta be so careful. Look, when I, when I made that video to try to get our governor to let, let us meet again, the news media was never on our side. They just wanted to pit me and the governor against each other. That was it. They don't wanna bring healing, they like starting fights. That's why you don't see me on the news anymore. They call almost every week. I don't answer anymore. Because they're not here to help us. I'm starting to believe they just want to see it all burn. That's not what I want. I just wanted to worship. I just wanted to worship. I just wanted to be able to be obedient to what God's called us to do. And then we got church members throwing rocks at each other because you forgot it's all about Jesus. It's not about the mask, it's about Jesus. It's not about the election, it's about Jesus. It's about Jesus. And number four, we're gonna close with this. You gotta realize that you will be judged the way you judge others. Jesus said, do not judge or you too will be judged for in the same way you judge others, you will be judged, listen to me, and with the measure you use, it will be used against you. So listen to me, wives. 
that critical spirit you have for your husband, your children will have for you. Husbands, that critical spirit you have for your wife, one day your children will have for you. You see that your children learn how to throw rocks from their parents. We gotta be so careful about throwing rocks. If you're a youth leader, you gotta be careful about what you post because you have young people. You have young people who will throw rocks. And if you're a front sider, I want you to listen to me. I want you to look carefully at this story and notice who was the last group to walk away. It was young people. It was young people. Because young people are full of enthusiasm. They're full of a sense of self-righteousness, a sense of ability to change, and oftentimes, what they bring is worse than what they replaced. You have to be so careful and if you're a young person, you're growing up in a day and age where you can kill somebody and slaughter them with your rock and you didn't have to see it hit them, you just post it and it'll wait for them to see it later. And let me just say this, if you're a Christian, if you're a Christian, if there are rocks in your hand, then Jesus doesn't have your heart. He doesn't have your heart. And listen to me, as your pastor, I get frustrated. I'm anxious. I see the same thing you see. I have the same worries, the same heartaches, the same concerns. But if this is in my hand, Jesus is in my heart. And if Jesus is in my heart, then I'm not headed to heaven. And what I think maybe that he was writing down on the ground was the sins of some of the leaders. Maybe it was some other women's names. Some women that he knew they had visited. Maybe some of them had been with her. We don't know. But listen to me. If we want the young to get it, the old people gotta walk away first. And some of you old people are just as unwise as the young. Put the rock down. Only Jesus Christ can change a heart. Think about it. Think about it. You want your kids to judge you? They will judge you as you age with the standard that you judge others. You want your friends to judge you? They will judge you with the standard that you judge them. We all need grace. We all need forgiveness. One of my favorite teachings, I'm gonna close with this. It was called the golden rule. It should be called the forgotten rule. But it's do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Even people you disagree with, even people who have offended you, sinned against you, hurt you, treat them the way you would wanna be treated and you will become a less judgmental person. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I pray in the mighty, powerful name of Jesus that we would learn to put down the rock. God, who is it that we are angry with? Who is it that we've been wounded by? Who is it that opposes us? Who is it that we don't think gets us? Lord, help us to put down that rock and help us to invite you, Lord Jesus Christ, into our hearts and remind us of your words and let us never forget that he who is without sin can throw the first stone and you, Jesus, could have thrown the rock but you chose not to because you are our rock. We love you, we serve you, and we invite you, Lord, to take control of our hearts. We pray this in your name, amen.